Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. So here I'm going to be talking about the Taimanov Sicilian, which is a bit strange because I'm not an expert in the Taimanov, um, and I've only recently started playing it. But I recently read um, excerpts of the book uh, by Herman Gruden, um, Understanding Before Moving, and he covered the Taimanov Sicilian, and I thought it was a really interesting topic that uh, I want to give you an overview on. Um, so yeah, after e4, c5, knight f3, e6, um, d4, the open Sicilian, cd4, knight d4, and the move knight c6 here. So it can be argued that the time of Sicilian either starts from this position or after knight c3 and queen c7. Or it can also be argued um, that the original system used by Mark Taimanov, the Soviet Grandmaster, um, is what is originally known as the Taimanov Sicilian. So Mark Taimanov originally uh, had the idea of first off playing a6, preventing any knight or yeah, knight jumps to b5 here, and then playing knight gE7, followed by taking on d4, queen takes d4, and knight c6. So replacing um, the knight on c6 with a knight from g8 here. And essentially that's uh, what he relied on. Um, however, uh, the modern treatment of the time of Sicilian is this idea of first off again playing a6, this is a universal move, preventing knight b5, uh, and after uh, some a specific setup that white chooses, especially against the Fianchetto variation, uh, black hat typically has this idea of, let's say, bringing the knight out to f6, taking on d4, and then developing the bishop out to c5 with tempo. So that's kind of the modern treatment of the Taimanov. But we don't really see that too often. I think that uh, for th the best lines for black uh, are really the ones that are the most um, dynamic and uh, they are very uh, situational, let's say. Um, and so... Yeah, um, I think that this variation of the Sicilian is very, it's like the most dynamic variation because uh, black is staying flexible, uh, potentially with uh, ideas of uh, breaking in the center with d5, or as ideas that we saw before, like taking on d4, developing the bishop out this way, or in some cases even developing out the bishop to e b4 uh, to pin the knight. And oftentimes this is in conjunction with the move knight f6, to put pressure on e4. Um, and this was an idea that uh, was used many times in the past, but I believe that more often than not, the bishop actually belongs in e7 uh, or even c5 more than it does belong in e4, um, because we'll look at the other options um, in this line with bishop b4 later, that black has some technical issues. Um, so yeah, um, along with this idea of like a6, uh, preventing knight b5, uh, the idea of a6 is also to push b5 on the queen side, uh, preparing bishop b7 to put pressure on the pawn on e4 and the long diagonal, as well as with this move knight f6. And this is why most of the time white plays move f3 to support the e4 pawn. Uh, but we can also see systems where white plays an early f4, uh, and this kind of weakens uh, the e4 pawn, but introduces the idea of meeting knight f6 with the move e5. And so I think that black should kind of delay the development of this knight, if possible, uh, seeing how white wants to develop their pieces. Um, and so um, a6 b5 with the idea of bishop b7 is an idea, um, and additionally black can play also on the c file, especially white castles long to put pressure on the c on the c2 pawn. Um, black can also uh, play knight f6 uh, and then eventually break with d5 in the future, but they really need to be careful of allowing this isolated pawn structure if white can still cast along. So I think that in this position where white is kind of uh, flexible in their setup, if we play an early d5, let's say um, bishop e3, knight f6, queen d2, um, and then a break with d5, say queen d2 and d5 here, I think that this is already very bad because after takes takes, white can just simply long castle. And the d-pawn is gonna be a much bigger weakness than black's activity because normally the bishops can get really nice on these diagonals let's say this um, b8 to h2 diagonal because uh, the white king is normally castle on the side of the board. But in here we see that the weakness of the d5 pawn is much more significant. So that's a couple of the ideas. Uh, additionally, one other idea is that with this a6 and b5 advance, the pawn can also land to b4. Uh, so that's an important intermezzo or in-between move that we need to consider. Uh, let's just say if the knight is on f6 and white plays f4 and e5, we can consider playing this move b4 so that uh, the knight is kicked away and then we can get the d5 square for our, our own knight. So yeah, that's just some of the ideas. Uh, additionally, in the past, in the 80s to 90s, this move knight b5 was quite popular and it was used um, by Anatoly Karpov. Um, and the idea behind this move is to... Uh, 
first off inf infiltrate on d6 with the knight and after d6 is to play this move c4 so the idea behind this setup is to control the d5 squares and the b5 squares so that it prevents any breaks of a6 b5 as well as e6 and d5 um and i think that there was there's also another system with bishop f4 but i think this is quite honestly it, it doesn't really work out for for white because after e5 bishop e3 and since now uh the line with bishop g5 is basically dead since there's this line with king d8 knight takes a8 but just yeah black black is just much better in this kind of position and this has been known for a long time so instead bishop e3 and then after knight f6 white black waits for uh the knight to come to c3 knight one to come to c3 so that then they can play a6 and kick, kick the knight to a3 instead and so let's uh, the main move is bishop g5 and essentially we get this position uh Let's just say knight one to c. If we see the position with knight one, knight one to c three, a six, knight a three, and b five here, I think b five is possible, preventing knight c four, for example. Um, yeah, essentially we see that this bishop has moved to f four and to e three and then to g five. So it, it has wasted three tempi. As compared to um, the Sveshnikov variation, um, for knight c six, d four takes takes, uh, or rather the Kalashnikov, I think, b five, knight b five d6 here, um, knight 1 to c3, a6, knight e3, b5, knight d5, and let's just say knight f6 is one of the moves, and the bishop g5, where basically uh, white has just spent one move to de develop this bishop to g5. And so I think that uh, it doesn't really work out uh, if black if white tries to go for this, uh, let's just say, that b5 move uh, followed by bishop f4. Um, I think that c4 is a critical try if they want to play this knight b5 on the fifth move. And after either bishop e7 or knight f6, um, I think that bishop e7 is a is a nice way to say that um, white can play like a move like bishop e3, and only now black can play knight f6, so that they're like preventing kind of, you know, the additional option of bishop g5, uh, since this is possible after knight f6. But according to theory, black is fine there. Um, and here, after knight 1 to c3, Black waits for the knight from b1 to come to c3, so that after a6, the knight is actually forced back to a3. And the idea behind white setup is to restrict white's pawn black's pawn advancements, and to force black into getting this hedgehog setup uh, by setting up bishop e7, ca bishop e2, castles, castles, and b6. So black gets uh, this so-called hedgehog setup, which um, looks pretty passive at first glance because all black's pieces are behind the sixth rank um, but actually has a lot of dynamic potential as we will see very soon um, so in the past this move d5 has been tried by uh, um, Kasparov against Karpov in their 1985 match and it was a novelty at the time but unfortunately it doesn't really stand the test of time uh, the idea is that after cd5 and ed5 and ed5 uh, black plays a move knight before and has ideas of either capturing the pawn back or after bishop c4 I think after, um, yeah, I think this way is c takes d is the most common way, and then knight b4. After bishop c4, um, yeah, black has this idea of bishop g4 and trying to gain a lot of activity for the pawn. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't really work after bishop e2, which is the best move, um, or rather, I, I think I think queen d4 is the best move here, uh, kind of being very annoying to black uh, with the queen very active on the d4 square. But in the match, bishop e2 is played after takes takes, queen e7. Um, yeah, this was played in the uh, in one of the uh, games of the 1985 match, which ended in a draw. Uh, additionally, bishop e2 is more commonly chosen after bishop c5, which is the idea. Castles, castles, bishop f3, bishop f5. And suddenly black gets quite a lot of competition with the possibility of bringing this, this knight to d3. Uh, an octopus knight, as um, people will call it. Um, and yeah, this is one of the lines that, were, that was possible, but it's not really the best. The best here is to play the move bishop e7, um, and after castles, bishop e2, castles, castles, and b6. Um, this is kind of a better version of the normal hedgehog because of this knight on e3, which is kind of wor much worse um, than normally being like either on d2 or uh, the knight on f3. Um, yeah, and an important idea here, here is to play first off bishop b7 to put pressure on e4, and we see that the problem uh, with the knight on c6 is that it actually um, blocks a c-file 
and also um, blocks this bishop's diagonal. And so it's or, it's important to get this knight to d7 really quickly. Um, there's also some tactical points after, let's say, bishop e3, bishop b7. If white plays a move like rook c1, a setup that we want to go for is kind of like queen c7 uh, and go for like rook c8 and then like queen b8 and queen a8 to put pressure on the long diagonal. Um, but the problem with that move is that uh, white has the response to knight d5, which is really strong. And after takes and takes, uh, c6 is going to be one next, and the b6 pawn becomes just a big weakness. So this is really bad for for black, which is why this idea of uh, bringing the knight to e5 and then to d7 is really important to get the knight out of the vulnerable uh, c6 square. Um, and after bishop e3, bishop b7, uh, queen b3 is the main move. And I'm just going to be discussing the critical tries and a general a guide for uh, you know how play could go. Um, black normally here plays knight d7, which both prepares knight c5, uh, defends the pawn on b6, and also prepares the move bishop f6 to play on this long diagonal. Um, and white can play either rook ad1 or rook fd1. It doesn't change a lot, but uh, essentially the idea is that black can play this move knight c5 as well. Uh, since now taking the pawn on c5 would be really bad strategically since it gives the d4 square away and the bishop cannot be taken because of knight e5 just simply trapping the queen uh, and so here the main move is queen c2 and um there are two moves here i think the best way to equalize is move bishop f6 and then after rook ac1 queen e7 so the queen is actually nicely placed on e7 here and is preparing rook, rook f to d8 uh, which is the cleanest equalizer um, and eventually preparing a d5 break when allowed. Um, let's say knight ab1. This is the main move because it sees that the, the knight, you know, white's, white has good development with their other pieces, but this knight on a3 is quite bad. So they try to improve the knight's position. Uh, and so in response to knight b1, this also has the additional idea of playing a3 and then b4, kicking our knight from c5 away. And so black has a very important move that I think is the only move in this position. This move knight b4. So it's important to play this move because the point is after the queen go, goes to d2, attacking the d6 pawn, rook f d8, white can never play a3 and b4 since first off a3 weakens the b3 square, so it allows the knight to come to b3 with a fork. And secondarily, um, yeah, th this a3 move is just never possible uh, under the right circumstances. So we can see this continuation after queen e1, which tactically defends against knight takes e4 and just keeps the queen out of the e-file. Um, because if we take on e4, simply the knight on b4 will be hanging. Which is why the main move in this position is a5, which weakens the b5 square, but uh, does actually threaten knight takes e4. And so now bishop f1. So now uh, we also notice that the b6 pawn is kind of weak, so we cannot take on e4. And I think black has two comfortable ways here uh, to go forward. Either they can play rook a b8, and then wait for white to play f3 so that d5 can hit, can hit much harder or play d5 immediately. And I think once black gets this break in, they're doing quite well. Um, so that's just an example of how this how this could go. Uh, additionally, uh, there's this nice game um, by Joel Lottier, I think, against uh, played against uh, Leonid Yudasin um, in the 1992 Olympiad, which continued queen c7, and then um, black managed to, uh, at, at some point, play rook fd8, like bishop f6, or I, I don't think bishop f6 was played. I think eventually, uh, once this knight moved away, moves like e5 and then knight e4 are possible uh, if the dark sword bishops have been exchanged. Um, and yeah, the, um, black went on to outplay their opponent in this game quite nicely. Um, so that's the gist of this uh, entire knight b5 and c4 setup, which I think black is doing quite well. Um, and against the made move knight c3, um, Black here first off can play the move d6, which is not the time enough. This enters the so-called Scheveningen variation. Um, but it's kind of better, it's a better version than playing the move order with knight f6, because after knight c3 and d6, white has this option of playing g4, the Keras attack, which is very dangerous. And I think I don't think black equalizes here. So uh, knight c6, knight c3, and d6 is another way to get the Scheveningen. Um, and additionally, a6 is also a possible move, um, but this allows an independent line. So if white plays the move bishop e3, then possibly after like queen knight f6, bishop d3, black should probably just play queen c7 and transpose into the uh, to the you know main line of the uh, time and off. 
Um, but they can also play that move d5, uh, which is tried by Fischer against Paskey in their 1972 match, the last game of it. Um, but as I mentioned before, white, black should be careful in advancing this uh, with playing this move d5, because if white has the option of castling long with, for example, takes takes and the move queen d2, which is not played in the game, I think that black is struggling because of the d5 pawn being such a big weakness. Um, so instead, queen c7 is probably better and just, you know, transposing into the normal um, time enough. But and so after this move a6, the critical move is knight takes c6. And the point is that after bc6, this inclusion of a6 is quite a is, is not great for black because um, let's just compare it with this with the move knight takes c6 in this position. After bc6, uh, knight c3, let's just say d5, bishop d3, uh, knight f6, um, castles, and uh, ideas of like bishop e7, f4, and something like this. And yeah, bishop a6 is a is a very interesting tactic here. Noting that takes in queen b6 is possible, but additionally there's this idea uh, of playing, um, let's just say rook e1, is to play a5 and bishop a6. I'm not sure if it's in this position or another position, but essentially this a5 and bishop a6 idea is very important uh, because this is our struggling bishop, and so we want to trade it off. And this bishop is quite good on this diagonal aiming at the black king side. And so this idea of a5 and bishop a6 is one way to try to equalize. Which is why in the variation after knight c3 and a6, taking on c6 is actually, makes actually a lot more sense since white, uh, since black has included this move a6, which makes their a5 and bishop a6 plan just one tempo slower. Uh, and so, for example, bishop d3, d5, castles, knight f6, rook e1, bishop e7, and completing development, uh, white has the move e5, knight d7, and queen g4, which creates some weaknesses. Um, let's say g6 here, and the bishop h6. This has been seen in Grandmaster play, but this is, um, yeah, kind of a uh, potentially unpleasant um, position for black, I could see, since the black king is not castling and white is very active. So, yeah, instead of that, a queen c7 is the main move. And white has the option of playing knight, b, knight d to b5 now, uh, with the idea that after queen b8, which is important to cover the d6 square, since queen d8 would run into knight d6 check, or first off bishop e3 actually is quite nice, um, or actually knight d6 is also just a clear advantage here with the weakness of the dark squares. Um, and so instead queen b8 is better, and we're potentially preparing to kick the knight away with a6, and so white has this interesting with bishop e3, and after a6, the knight has sooner, you know, has to be kicked sooner or later away. Um, it's possible to, to retreat knight back with knight d4, but the intention normally is to play this move bishop b6, um, a variation um, that uh, Hermann Gruden calls the um, Punamaria variation as he started this trend. Um, the idea is to um, is to sacrifice a piece, but infiltrate on c7 with the knight, and it looks very dangerous because the black king can possibly get uncastled in this variation. Um, but we have this move bishop b4. So with bishop b4, check, it provokes c3, and then the bishop comes back to a5 to actually cover the c7 square with the idea that after knight c7, black can sacrifice the queen. And black has now three pieces uh, for the queen and a pawn. And the main move here is queen g4, but I think black is actually doing better in this position. One game that we can follow is after g6, bishop b5, um, king f8. The, actually, the king actually goes to g7, and black has a very good score in this kind of position, as we see in the database. Uh, castles, king g7, queen e2, and black broken with d5. This was a game um, played by Robin van Kampen in 2014. And after rook fd1, knight f6, uh, black just has a very nice control over the center. f3, d4, f4, and then knight e5. And with the knight possibly coming to g4, the white king turns out to be not that comfortable. h3 was played to prevent knight uh, g4, but h5, c4, b6, preparing bishop b7, b4, bishop b7, rook d4, and here uh, an improvement over the game is the move rook a3 actually, uh, just preparing rook h to a8 and putting pressure on the a pawn. But in the game rook hd it was played and black managed to win still um, because of the weaknesses in a uh, white position, especially the e4 pawn. Um, but yeah, uh, this is the this is this so-called uh, queen sacrifice line which is quite good for black. 
Um, instead, they can also play the early f4 move, uh, which is obviously very aggressive. And here I think black should play the move a6, uh, just with the typical uh, move preventing knight b5. If they play knight takes d4, uh, this allows the queen to be active on d4, but this has been tried in the past. Uh, idea is, is to prepare e6, b5 with very quick counterplay. Um, and after bishop e3, b5, castles and bishop e7, um, black has problems completing development, especially on the king side, since uh, possibly knight f6 will be hit with e5. Uh, e5, let's say knight f6, e5, um, knight d5, and then knight e4 potentially coming to d6. Um, and uh, Paramarja Negi, um, the Indian Grandmaster, has tried this position in the past twice with decent results. Um, so it is possible, but there are some problems with development there, uh, which is why the most principled move is just to play a6. Um, and yeah, the original intention uh, with this move, queen c7, I have to say, is to capture on c6 uh, with the queen. So after the main move, knight takes c6 here, uh, queen takes c6 is the best move. However, oftentimes we will see um, either b takes c6 or d takes c6 in other variations. Um, it's also possible to play a3 here, which was played by Korchnoi against uh, Yuri Averbach in 1959. And But after b5, black just gets a good game here with bishop b7, d6, preventing the pawn to go to e5, and then knight f6. And even though the bishop gets stuck on f8, this position is no problem for black uh, with really good counterplay um, yeah, on the queen side already. Since this move a3 is typically quite, um, yeah, quite accommodating for black, um, since it does prevent bishop b4, but there was no intention to play bishop b4 uh, to begin with. Um, instead, knight takes c6 is the main move, and if we play like b takes c6, after bishop d3 and d5, we just enter the variation we saw before with the early a6 instead of queen c7. Um, and so knight queen takes c6 here is the best move and more ambitious. And after bishop d3, black expands on the queen side with b5. Let's say queen e2, uh, preparing um, bishop d2 and the long castles. This is the more uh, aggressive setup. Clearly, if white decides to castle short, then this entire idea with um, with f4 and e4 uh, doesn't really... Um, yeah, it can potentially weaken the king side, but it is definitely possible. Uh, instead, bishop b7, bishop d2, and then bishop c5 is best, um, improving the bishop long castles, and then knight e7, since the knight on f6 would be hit with e5. So knight e7. And now, queen h5 was thought to be a problem in the past, but surprisingly, after the move castles, uh, black has enough defense with possibly um, f6 and the rook f7 coming in the future, um, so that if white plays e5, f5 can be played to close down the position. Um, and here, for example, g4 was played in the past, but for b4, uh, knight e4, so now if we take on a4, there is queen takes c5. And uh, white just has the bishop pair aiming at black's king while the knight on e7 is hanging. We need to move it again. So instead, d6 is better, defending the knight. And after in this game, b, b3 was chosen and uh, eventually um, a5. And black just got a really good game with the idea of bishop a6 next to trade off this very strong bishop just aiming at the black king. And black had no problems. Um, so yeah. Uh, instead, a3 is better. Is a better move than queen h5 there, um, preventing b5 to b4 and getting ready to advance with g4 and then possibly f5 or g5. Uh, and here castles and black has enough defenses again. Uh, for example, rook hf1, and I like this move f5, which is the main move. Um, and I think that black should be doing fine here um, with a very imbalanced game, but very dynamic and attacking for both sides. Um, in the past, a move like b4 has been chosen after takes takes and f5, f6 was played, and this is also a very interesting approach, which closes down, tries to close down the um, the attack. Um, but I think that white still has some uh, edge in this kind of position. Um, so yeah, this covers this move f4. Um, the next move is g3, which is the fianchetto variation. It's it's actually uh, underrated in my opinion. Um, so first off, since we see that Black's uh, Black's idea oftentimes, for example, um, if they if they play move like c4 on the fifth move, here we can play knight of six, knight c3. I just want to illustrate this idea with bishop b4, which becomes really strong because uh, this knight on c3 is 
uh, defending the e4 pawn. And so this becomes a bit annoying. And for example, if white plays a move like queen d3, then I think black can just castle, uh, let's say bishop e3, and they hit the center with d5. And I think black is just better already. Uh, or at the very least equal. Um, but yeah, this idea of like bishop b4 and following it up with d5 is a typical idea. So I want to compare that with uh, this move g3. Uh, where actually this d5 break is controlled because the bishop is going to end up on this long diagonal. So this is a very uh, positional system, but I do think that black is fine. And also with this move bishop g2 next, knight takes c6 becomes a possibility since queen takes c6 is not really desirable with this bishop on the long diagonal targeting the queen. And so oftentimes d takes c6 is better. So if we play the move, uh, let's say a6 here first off, preventing knight b5, bishop g2, knight f6, castles, um, or let's say after knight f6, if white plays the move knight takes c6 here, we want to take back with the d-pawn here. That's very important. Um, because if we take back with the b-pawn, we notice that if we play the move d5, we do get a good stake in the center, but our bishop on c8 is just struggling for the rest of the game. And even on, on a6, it doesn't really do much after white castles and the play rook, plays rook e1. So it's important here in this fianchetto variation to take on c6 with the d-pawn, and then eventually continue it, continue it up with either e5 uh, and the bishop c5, and getting the bishop active on the other diagonal, this one, the h3 to c8 diagonal. Um, uh, but it's at castles. Um, and the main treatment of the time off, the modern treatment is knight takes d4. But in the past, the moves bishop c5 and bishop e7 have been played. Uh, bishop c5, I don't think it's, I think this is the worst of the three options. But it makes sense because the idea behind the time off is normally to keep flexible with the d-pawn so that the bishop can go outwards. Uh, but here there are some problems. After knight takes c6, um, this is the typical problem, is that we need to take back with the d-pawn. And white has his move knight e4, uh, try and take over some dark squares on the queen side. And this becomes really annoying for for black, since after bishop a7, white, white can play c4, threatening c5 to just shut down this bishop forever. And um, knight d7 is the main move, uh, preventing knight c5, uh, or preventing c5 here, but then b4. So again, with a positional approach here, uh, instead of they play queen g4, uh, which has been played by Sarge in World Bliss 2018, just trying to get target the king side, um, castles here is good, bishop f4, queen a5. Um, and I think that black gets a lot of activity and gets a great position. Um, and so instead of queen g4, b4 is better. And here, um, I don't think that any moves really work out for, uh, for, for, for black here. Um, if you play a move like c5, then I think either b5 here is very good and the bishop is still still shut out, or there are some other technical problems, I'm sure, which is why the main move is b5, uh, or sorry, a5 rather. Uh, b5 has been tried in the past, but as long as white does not take on b5 here uh, and just plays knight b2 with potential idea of a4, uh, black is just kind of struggling here. There's also the idea of c5 again, shutting out the dark sword bishop. Uh, and so, uh, if black castles here, then e5 is also a very nice move. Opening up the diagonal with deadly effect. Let's say knight b6, attacking uh, c4, c5, and then knight d5, where black's bishops are just very, very bad. And um, the knight on d5 is nice, but the problem of these two bishops are much greater. Um, and so, white can also play the move, uh, black can also play the move c5 here, trying to break, uh, trying to break on the queen side. But after the move queen g4, um, this would give a white, white a big advantage um, with the king side possibly being compromised and the queen side also. Um, the, yeah, this this tension kind of favors white. Um, white is also has a lead in development with this bishop on this nice diagonal. So yeah, uh, that's the possible line that could happen after b5. a5 here is interesting. Trying to uh, trying to get uh, some trying to create some weaknesses on the queen side here. But after the move b5, um, we can't even play bishop castles here because bishop a3 would just infiltrate the d6 with decisive effect. And so here e5 is best. And after queen g4, uh, creating some weaknesses after g6, queen f3 and bishop d4, um, white can play the very strong move here, bishop e3. And the dark sword bishop is a key asset in black's defense since these dark swords are weak. And also the queen side, uh, the queen side squares are very weak. And so if white is able to even win the bishop, uh, the rushed bishop, just for the, even just for the exchange, this is 
a strategically winning uh, advantage for for white so um yeah this line i think is facing some problems um this bishop c5 line uh, and so bishop e7 is another line um which is not the original intention of the time and off which is to develop it out to b4 but it's very solid at least to like shevening in type positions after rook e1 it's important here to castle and just ignore the threat of e5 uh if we take on d4 here uh it doesn't work actually because white has this very strong move e5 and it's unexpected but white has an advantage now for example we t if we play knight c6 after ef6 uh, we have to play gf6, since uh, bishop takes here, runs it to like maybe bishop f4, uh, and then knight e4, uh, since uh, we can't even play e5 since knight d5 comes. So, for example, gf6, but then after queen g4, what is just strategically winning, since black's king is never getting castled, uh, these, this structure is very weak, and uh, there are some dark sword weaknesses still in, in um, black's position. So... That's not good, a knight takes d4, but it gets hit with this very surprising e5. Uh, after d6 here, it looks like the threat of e5 has been parried, but after knight c6, bc6, and e5, I think that once uh, black gets in this move, d e5, rook e5, saying that now you can't take on e5 because bishop takes c6 will simply win a pawn, uh, and then taking the rook on the in the corner. But after castles and bishop f4, white just has a big initiative here, I think, uh, with moves after queen b7, it's to play knight a4, and infiltrate the, the dark squares. Rook d8, queen f3, knight d5, and then bishop d2. With c4 coming next, black is seriously struggling here. So, uh, instead, castles is better, ignoring the threat of e5, but after knight c6 and dc6, which is important, since if we play bc6, uh, again, e5 here, and then knight d5, knight e4 here, with preparing c4 next. Um, and infiltrating all the dark squares. This is really good for black, uh, for white, sorry. So instead, d takes e6, and then now e5. And so here we can hit the queen with tempo, rook d8, after queen f3, knight d5. After h4, uh, white starts uh, kingside play and has a stable advantage and I think more space, which is kind of, you know, uh, black is very uh, very much struggling in this kind of position. But it's, uh, according to the computer, it's only slight advantage. Um, so it's possibly playable, but not something that black's looking forward to. Um, and yeah, white has very simple ideas of improving their uh, pieces and kind of trying to generate a, a kingside attack in the future in this game uh, by Wang Hao against Andrekin, or rather Tivyakov um, versus Michael Adams. This was a very nice game as well. Um, so instead, uh, knight takes d4 is legitimately the only way to equalize here after queen takes d4 and bishop c5 if white retreats with with queen d3 uh, this also makes sense i think there's this very strong move knight g4 preparing knight e5 um and yeah black seems to be doing fine in this position since they gain control over the e5 square very nicely uh, which is why the main test in this variation is the move bishop f4 saying that now if you take on d4 i will take on c7 and now your doctors are severely weak I have a lead in, white has a lead in development and can also look in the future to kind of harass the queen side since there is a weakness on b6 here and white is just doing much better. Uh, instead d6 is the main move, shutting out this bishop but making this d6 pawn kind of a target after queen d2. It's important here since we want to play the move e5 so that our d6 pawn is not under threat. It's We want to play this move but we don't want to run into bishop g5 where we essentially uh, get uh, a potential of bishop takes f6 and then knight d5 there, you know, fighting for the critical d5 square in this kind of knight or structure, uh, which is why it's important here um, to play the move h6, preventing bishop g5, and then after rook ad1, e5, shutting out the bishop, bishop e3. So it's important to know also that the darkstar bishop in black's camp is the um, is an important attacking piece, and so black in general is very happy to exchange. Um, exchange the bishops off and here uh king e7 has been tried in the past uh, but uh, the, so the idea is that after bishop c5 um the queen can actually go to c5 and maintain kind of like a very similar you know um structure uh, in the um in the sicilian of you know this this pawn structure here um but i think the white is having some troubles uh, in the game uh especially after shown in the game uh Sitowski versus polgar in 1997 I think that game uh, kind of uh, shut this game um, for good, uh, shut this line out for good. 
so instead, bishop e6 is better. And after bishop takes e5, d takes e5, white has this move knight d5, trying to create an imbalance and the pass pawn. But after bishop takes d5, e d5, black should definitely not ignore this pawn, uh, possibly advancing here and opening up the bishop's diagonal. So here, after queen d6, just blockading the pawn. Um, black is doing quite well. Um, I think that white has a slight edge in this kind of position, but it's very much holdable and black has no theoretical problems here. Uh, both f4 uh, and just putting pressure with rook fe1, rook e3, doubling up here are possible plans that white can choose from. Um, so yeah, I think that's, um, you know, uh, this main line is kind of what uh, black should be, uh, white should be expecting if they play the, um, if they should play the Vienkato variation. But black seems to be holding there. Uh, so instead of g3, bishop e2 is possible here. So they can either white can either play bishop e2 now, or play bishop e3, uh, a6, and then bishop e2. Um, and so yeah, these lines can transpose. But after bishop e2, this is a flexible system, saying that I want to, I maybe want to play bishop e3, but I can also just not include that move and just play castles, um, where it may be actually useful to not spend a move on bishop e3. So here, a6, very typical Taimanov move, castles and knight f6. This is this reaches the main tabia um, of yeah of this uh, variation. Um, if here, if you play a move like b5, then after knight c6, this is the main problem, and dc6. White has this very typical idea in this kind of structure to play a4. Oops, not a3, but rather a4, and saying that now if you play bishop b7. Uh, you're never getting the move c5 because I will simply take on b5, winning a pawn. And if you ever play the move b4, then this makes a very big weakness on c4 with the knight coming here and here, and maybe bishop e3. And we can see that the b6 square uh, and the dark squares in general are just very weak. And yeah, white just has a, has a long-term advantage there. Which is why, um, especially if black plays the move b5, uh, if you're playing with the white pieces, you can consider this takes takes and then a4 uh, decision. Um, yeah, knight f6 here is the main move, and here it's possible to play king h1, which is white's most ambitious option, preparing f4, uh, since they cannot play f4 immediately, since knight takes d4, just loses to bishop c5 with uh, winning the queen. And so, um, king h1 is very aggressive, after knight takes d4, queen d4, again bishop c5, gaining a tempo on the queen, queen comes to d3, uh, preparing either to g3 or h3, possibly, uh, and then now b5 preparing bishop b7. And so here we're being flexible with uh, not castling on the king side because we don't want to be attacked on the king side and just walk right into it. So here bishop b7 is logical. After f4, bishop b7, bishop f3. Black here can actually break with d5. Uh, this was played by Kazim Jonov in 2017. And this is, uh, this I think just equalizes for black. After ed5, black can simply castle and get a lot of compensation for the pawn. Um, for example, in the game, bishop e3 was played, but after rook fd8, okay, rook d 8 is better, but rook fd8 was chosen, queen c5, uh, bishop, c, uh, bishop c5, queen c5, and then a4 is played, but after b4, knight e4, takes, takes, and then g6, black is simply better since um, white's attack is stopped, and even though they no longer have the dark sword bishop, um, this bishop on this diagonal is quite strong, and this pawn is still being pinned, um, and black has achieved d5 successfully, in an open Sicilian, which is in general uh, very um, a very good thing to have accomplished. Uh, so instead of bishop e3, d6 just takes the pawn, but after rook d8, black just gets tremendous initiative. For example, queen e2, rook d to e8 even, and if white takes the pawn here, they're just simply going to be in bad shape. Uh, rook f7, and then uh, attacking the queen again, and we see that the white queen actually has no good, like really uh, is lacking a lot of squares. Um, and for example, queen f5 um, here would possibly be the only square for the queen to be safe. But then after bishop f3, uh, yeah, forces gf3 since with takes f3, I believe loses to b4 uh, with the back rank being so weak. Um, so yeah, e takes f7, taking the pawn is not good. But so they can play queen d3 here. Um, and then after rook takes e6, um, yeah, essentially white, black is still down a pawn. But with the doubling of rooks next, blacks get, black gets a lot of activity for the um, for the pawn. And for example, bishop d2 can't even be played because rook d8 simply uh, traps the queen. Or it's forced to go to f5, after which it will lose the bishop on d2. So yeah, that's just an example 
um, where black gets a lot of compensation in this line. Uh, but d5 is definitely not the main move. Um, and so, but this is the cleanest equalizer. Um, instead of king h1, bishop b3 is the main move. And now d6. So this slow approach is probably best because if black plays him with bishop b4, there was this, there's this very nice move, knight a4, which kind of shook up the evaluation of this line, sacrificing the e4 pawn. Uh, and so it's not good to take this pawn because potentially, I think, uh, either bishop f3 or uh, the knight coming to b6 here is very, very good for, um, very good for white. Uh, queen c6, knight b6, I'm guessing. And yeah, in general, uh, allowing the knight to come here and then ruin black's coordination is just really bad. Queen d4 and all black's, all white pieces get, get active. Uh, also with a fork on this and g7, forcing bishop f8 back, which is just miserable. Um, so yeah, instead, uh, bishop e7 is the main move, and then after knight c6, bc6, knight b6, rook b8, takes, and the queen takes, we get this position after bishop d4, where white is just slightly better here, um, because of white having the bishop pair, uh, you know, some space advantage with the pawn on d4, uh, and things like that. But in the past, uh, rook takes e8 has been played by Karpov against Jan Smekal in the 1973 interzonal. Uh, which sacrifices the a6 pawn fully, and this is a very unsound sacrifice after bishop a6 and rook b8, bishop d3, bishop d6. So this is another idea in the time and off that the bishop is actually controlling the dark squares in this diagonal. Uh, and for example, can even go to e5. For example, in the game king h1 was played, then after bishop e5, c3, uh, rook takes b2, queen c1, white, uh, black unleashes this move knight g4, which is very nice. Since queen takes b2, uh, loses to uh, bishop takes c3, unleashing an attack on, oops, unleashing an attack on h2 and the queen. Uh, so instead, if f4 was played, but after takes queen takes b2, bishop takes f4, black is simply better with dark sword domination here, and managed to win the game. But instead, the problem behind this entire sacrifice is that white can simply block the diagonal, and also look in the future to play f4, uh, and this does give away the uh, b2 pawn. But white also had a, has another asset, is this pass pawn. And white is simply just better in this position. Um, so, yeah, which is why this move bishop b4 has been tried, but it's not good at all after knight a4. Um, instead, d6 is better. This slow approach after, bishop, after f4, bishop e7, uh, we reach a position where it's clear that white has um, a lot of attacking potential with queen e1 and queen g3, maybe. And also the bishop comes to d3 most of the time to try to attack h7. But I think if black knows the very thematic idea uh, that, I'll, that I will show in this video, they will be fine. After queen e1, castles, queen g3, um, white needs to play possibly bishop d3 and then rook h1 to defend the center. And after that, if they're given enough time, they're just going to be better. Which is why black should first off take on d4 here so that they can prepare b5 without running into knight c6. Uh, so for example, if, if we play b5 here, knight c6 followed by e5. It's just very good with bishop f3 to come. Uh, bishop f3, yeah. And so we take on d4 here, bishop d4 and then b5. A threatening b4 to win the pawn on e4. Potentially, uh, not exact, not immediately since the g7 pawn is under threat, but with bishop b7 next. And so here, if white plays e5, this is quite, this is not the best because after de5 and let's say fe5, the diagonal is just blocked to the, to the, um, yeah, to the black king. And so bishop c5 here is nice to trade off the dark sword bishops, which again is one of white's most important pieces uh, to attack. And so that should be fine for, for black. And so a3 uh, prevents b4, but after bishop b7, uh, rook a e1 is possible. And after rook a d8, bishop d3. As soon as we see bishop d3, we need to look, which is not covering the h5 square, we need to look at this move e5. And I think this equalizes. After fe5, knight h5 misplaces the queen and prepares to capture back on e5. After queen f3 and de5, black is simply fine because they have um, a tremendous control over the dark, the dark squares in this position. Uh, and also, for example, king h1 has been tried, but after bishop c6, preparing either rook d 8 um, and then also queen b7 to put pressure on e4. Black has good counterplay here. For example, rook a1, trying to overprotect e4, rook a8, and if they play bishop d3, again, this move e, uh, first off queen d7. So I think e5 is, e5 is possible. fe5, knight h5, queen f2, 
But yeah, there seems to be this tactical problem with bishop b6. So um, that should be avoided. Z queen d7 is better, defending b5, the b5 pawn, and preparing to play on the queen side with a5 and b4, potentially. Um, so after knight d1, um, which is an attempt to try to improve the knight to f2, defending e4, uh, knight h5 here, queen g4, knight f6, prepares a repetition. I think this is the only line that equalizes. But if white decides to play on with queen e2, then queen b7, putting pressure on e4, knight f2, knight d7, preparing e5 next, knight g4, then f6 here just equalizes since black is going to play e5 uh, yeah, at the right moment. Let's see knight e3, even wins a pawn, and a queen g4, knight c5, and white has enough compensation, but nothing more uh, for for this pawn. Um, so black should be holding, even though it does seem kind of scary at first glance that you know all of white's pieces and their bishops are aiming down at the black king. They should be fine if they know this very uh, all of these thematic ideas. And so the main move is the move bishop e3 on the sixth move. And after a6, white has a variety of systems to choose from here. They can play bishop e2, which just transposes to the line we saw before. Or they can play queen f3, which is the modern move, repairing the idea of queen g3, as well as long castles. Um, we will see that in a bit. Uh, they can also play bishop d3 here, which defends e4, but I don't think it's the best option. It's definitely playable, though. Or the move queen d2 here, which is the main move. And so the idea is just to get this English attack set up with long castles and then f3, g4. But I think black is doing quite well after knight f6. First off, nicely putting pressure on e4. Um, and it also has the idea of maybe playing knight g4 to harass the bishop. After long castles, I think black should play the move bishop e7. So you might be asking why not bishop e4? But I think that um, the bishop is better on e7, since clearing out the b4 square means that b5 and b4 can be a possibility. Uh, so you can check the line with bishop b4 in the annotation, but essentially the line can go like f3, and then uh, white can play knight e black can play knight e5, preparing knight c4, but then knight b3. And this is a very nice consolidating move, just opening up the d-file and adding a piece to the white king's defense. Uh, and after b5 here, trying to create counterplay on the queen side, white has this interesting move, queen e1. Uh, threatening knight takes b5, uh, where if we take on b5, the bishop on b4 hangs. And now knight takes b5 doesn't lose the queen since knight takes c7 is a counterattack on the queen. And so black's main move, uh, or bl black's main move is bishop e7, um, but after f4, knight g6, and e5, knight g4, uh, white gets in this move knight e4. And I think black is kind of struggling with, for example, uh, if we take on e3, which normally we want to get rid of this bishop, right? But after queen takes e3, knight d6 is the, is you know, a positional threat, and this is very uh, difficult. And instead, if we castle, after bishop c5, fighting for control of the d6 square, and bishop b7, h3, forcing the knight back to h6, taking on e7, then bishop d3, what is simply better since they have a strong initiative, uh, as seen in the game MVL against Vityugov in 2008. Uh, the game continues something like this, with white having an advantage. Um, so... Yeah, bishop e7 is not really good. Uh, rook b8 is possible, um, but after, for example, queen g3, castles, bishop d4, bishop d6, and f4, this leads to a very interesting queen sacrifice after knight h5. And if white plays a move like queen f2, then simply knight takes f4, wins a pawn, since you can't take back due to knight d3, and black is just much better. And so f e5 here is a very nice queen sacrifice, that after knight takes g3, ed6, queen d6, h takes g3, queen takes g3, white has three pieces for a queen and two pawns, but the problem is that this bishop is also stuck to defend the d7 pawn after white plays, let's say, rook h3, which is tried by Wang Yi against Yu Yang Yi, um, and after queen g5 check, bishop e3, and queen g6, white can play e5 and get a strong initiative with bishop d3 coming, knight c5 coming, and the problem is that they, they can't really consolidate their material advantage because this d7 pawn is weak, and if you ever play bishop b7, you'll just undefend it. And so white just has a nice advantage here. It's close to plus one, or even yeah, somewhere around there. Um, which is why bishop b4 is not best. Instead, bishop e7 is better. 
and after f3 to play b5, getting counterplay. And see, we see we see that black does not castle uh, short uh, so early on since they're keeping flexible and don't want to run straight into the attack. White can play king b1 or play g4, which can transpose. And here, it's important to take on d4. So after here, bishop takes d4, uh, play bishop b7, and king b1, castles. Uh, white's main move is queen f2. Um, trying to info yeah trying to improve the queen's position potentially g5 um and also i think just in general the queen belongs on the on the king side here to try to advance the pawns but here i think d5 should should reach equality in this line uh the correspondence just has shown this but we can see that the line gets quite wild g5 both knight d7 and knight h5 are uh are drawing but uh with correct play but knight h5 here is nice because it controls the f4 square um, and here bishop b6 is possible, queen b8, still controlling the f4 square, ed5, and now b4, counterattacking, knight e4, typical idea to try to control some of the dark squares, and now bishop d5. And so black gets, you know, optically gets a quite a nice position here. Uh, after bishop e3, black can play also queen b7, getting out of knight b6, um, since now they can respond with rook ad8, now knight b6, rook ad8, and again, it's, it, now it's important to take away the bishop, since that's a very strong piece. Rook takes d5, and now bishop g2. Now black can exchange the rooks off, and we're just following this correspondence game. After g6, f4, queen c7, b3, rook d8, trying to trade off the, the rooks. Rook takes, queen takes, bishop b7, a5, bishop f3 back, knight g7, and after bishop g4 and knight f5, this position is simply equal since, um, yeah, black, even though white has the bishop pair, um, they can't really make full advantage of it. For example, when the bishop is not on this diagonal and can't even, uh, you know, create a battery with the queen on d4. For example, trying to uh, create some checkmating threats. But instead, after bishop f5, um, a draw was agreed here. And yeah, it's a very, it's just an equal position at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, don't underestimate black's chances because oftentimes in in these a simplified uh, queen, you know, positions and games with the queens on the board. Uh, Black still has the opportunity of being better. Uh, so going back here, all the way back um, to White's options after Bishop e3 and a6 here. So um, let's look at the other options. So Bishop d3, the less critical of the moves. Um, so first off, this is Bishop defends e4, but you can see that after uh, moves like knight e5, the bishop can be taken, and in that way we will win the bishop here and uh, get a fine position. And so after knight f6, castles, and knight e5, I think black is doing quite well. Let's say h3, bishop c5, you're getting the bishop out and preparing to play d6 next with a solid position, queen e2, and d6. So we're going to follow a game that Ding Loren played against Dubov in a rapid game. Uh, he got a good position but lost after rook d1, castles, f4, knight g6. It's often we see that like the knight gets kicked around from like e5, but this is no problem because like moving any of the pawns forward as we will see in this game uh, isn't exactly what white wants. White just wants to maintain this strong center and try to build up the pressure there. And so if they play move like f5, which is played in the game, knight e5, now we get the outpost on e5 for the knight, g4, h6, and uh, yeah, this attack just simply won't break through. Uh, after knight f3, uh, e takes f5, Knight takes e5, d5, and gf5, opening up the g-file. Black was already better after b5, followed by bishop b7. Um, and uh, in the game, it continued like rook g1, king h7, and we have ideas of bishop d4 here uh, to uh, possibly allow a pawn to take on d4. Um, and rook g3 was played, rook g8, simply defending, uh, rook d to g1, and now bishop takes e3. This is quite a nice decision. Uh, I think it's an improvement over the game. We, um, after bishop b3, queen e3, we can play b4, knight e4, and then continue with knight h5, followed by knight f4. We can play also on the c file with rook e c8. And after knight f4, we can even consider the move g5 so that we can cement the knight on f4. And I think black is already much better here. So that's just, a, just one sample line in the bishop d3 line. The next move here is queen f3, which is uh, what people call to be the test uh, against the Taimanov, the modern test. And I think uh, Seth Rahman, Indian Grandmaster, he wrote a book on this, recommending this against the Taimanov for white. And if we play a move like bishop e4, it's important to understand the dynamics between giving up the, the dark bishop for this knight to double the pawns. 
Um, and in this position, uh, we need to understand that even if we take on c3, oftentimes white is very happy with just getting the bishop pair because giving up the dark to bishop for black just weakens all the dark squares and makes it more difficult to cover those weaknesses. Um, and so here, a good move is just simply castling. Since the double pawns don't matter much after this, knight g7, and white playing the move queen g3, uh, just, which is the main intention of queen f3, which is to take on g3 after we do this. White simply has an advantage here because of the open h-file, the weaknesses on the dark squares here, and also white has the bishop here. And all of these give white an advantage, simply. Uh, uh, the critical test is, is actually knight takes c6, and if we take on c3 here, bc3, queen c6, white can even play c4, and white has a b big advantage here because of control of the d5 square, and um, yeah, it doesn't really matter that these pawns are doubled, uh, knight e7, bishop d3, and white's double pawns are useful in actually controlling these squares, and the black bishop just struggles to get in the game, uh, so this is just very, very, very bad for black. Uh, so instead, knight f6 is the main move. And here, uh, if white plays a move like queen g3, then after takes takes, I think the move bishop b4, yeah, knight g4 here is actually problematic uh, on the bishop. So you're gonna have to maybe take on c6, but then knight e3 intermezzo. And this is really bad threats on here. Uh, we can also win the other bishop. Uh, let's just say knight d4, knight takes f1. And white has a bishop pair, like even two bishops, uh, pawns are doubled here and uh, this is much better for black. And so queen g3 doesn't work now. So the main move here instead of queen g3 is to play castles. And we can actually avoid the entire queen g3 idea completely by playing this move knight e5, uh, which hits the, hits the queen and also prepares b5 without running into knight takes c6. Uh, and so here after queen g3, uh, black can play b5 and get counterplay on the queen side. Um, and here, a lot of things can happen. For example, white can take on b5 here with the bishop. And after a takes b5, and d takes b5, queen b8, forced to defend the knight, and the bishop f4, attacking the attacking the knight, black can play d6 here. And white has uh, a few sacrifices they could go for, either knight takes d6 or rook takes d6. And rook takes d6 we will, we will look at here, uh, and it's important to play knight h5, uh, winning the bishop, uh, potentially, if allowed. Okay, so queen g5, first off, importantly, threatening checkmate, so knight takes d6, bishop takes d6 is important, knight takes d6 check, Queen takes d6 and bishop takes e5, uh, winning back one piece. And now, if we don't, yeah, if we don't do anything, simply the knight is gonna fall, and white is just gonna have a great position. Um, yeah, and they have like three pawns for the exchange, which is much better. But instead, we have this move rook a5, which is important, uh, pinning the pinning the bishop. And white has two options: they can either play f4 or play knight d5. Uh, so f4 normally has the idea of also playing knight d5, since we can play knight takes f4. And taking on f4 would just be very bad. Um, and so knight d5, again, uh, is the main move, trying to uh, shut down this uh, this pressure. And so here the main move is rook takes d5. Uh, only move after e d5. We can play this knight e2 check, intermezzo, king b1, and then take on d5 with the queen. And queen takes g7, rook f8, and white can get some loot with b3. And we get this inter interesting position, which is quite unclear, but according to the computer, this is equal. But I seriously don't know uh, which side I prefer playing. Um, yeah, perhaps the black king is kind of stuck here, and I think black will probably play like f6 and rook f7 in the future. Um, yeah, try to get some, uh, try to get some space and uh, fighting against the archer bishop. But yeah, still the position is kind of unclear. Um, yeah, and after rook a5, they can also play knight d5 immediately. But here the only move is queen d7, and after bishop takes g7. Uh, threatening knight f6, so we can't take on, g, uh, on g7, rook g8, and now queen takes h5, threatening again knight f6. So now we have to take on d5, queen h7, give back one exchange, um, and then rook takes a2, queen h8, king e7, and the correct result here after queen h4 is just simply a draw. Uh, black can step up with king e6, but I think that uh, it will eventually reach a perpetual nonetheless. So that's the line with bishop takes b5. And instead, if white plays f4, which is the main move, uh, white can play, black can play knight e to g4 and attacking this bishop. And it's important to keep this bishop on the board. Um, so bishop g1, and then now h5, supporting the knight in case of white, white playing, uh, black playing, white playing e5. And so now e5 is the main move. 
And now if you move the knight away, it'll simply like give too many squares for the white knight. So now b4 intermezzo is an important move. And there are a lot of complications that could happen. For example, I will just give one sample line here. Knight e4, uh, play on the queen side. Knight d5, h3, kicking the knight back to h6. And then f5 here, making sh uh, pointing out that this knight is actually loose on the, the d5 square. So now bishop e7, bishop d3. And this was uh, seen uh, in a lot of Grandmaster games actually. Uh, after bishop e7, king b1, h4. And now the point is that after queen takes g7, long castle will simply trap the queen after rook d to g8 comes. Uh, and so queen e1 is the best move. And then knight f4, attacking g2 and attacking the bishop. Uh, if bishop e4, then after knight takes g2, uh, queen comes to e2, attacking the knight. And this is all very forcing lines. So it's like very, it's very, yeah, like you need to memorize this, whether you like it or not, if you're going to play this line. Uh, knight f4, queen f3. Bishop e4, queen e4, and knight d5, um, blocking the attack on the rook. Queen g2, and now attacking g7, so bishop f8. And so I just want to um, stop the analysis here because the line can go on for uh, a lot, yeah, for a lot longer. But the idea, but the point is that white does not have a clear path to advantage, and black's position is hanging on by a thread. But a pawn is a pawn, and so um, this is very much playable for black. Going back here, uh, instead of bishop e4, knight b6 is also possible. Just give a sample line, rook d8, knight c4, and a lot of, I think, correspondent games have continued like this. Knight d3, cd3, bishop d5, rook c1, bishop c4, just removing that strong knight from potentially coming to d6. Queen a5, f e6, f e6, bishop f2, and now queen d5. Nicely centralizing the queen, queen e3, and now castles. And this was a, just a correspondence game that continued knight f3, uh, b3, trying to uh, create a target on the on the king here, rook b8, queen e4, and then exchanging the queens off this way, and takes takes, and e5, king b2, and I think a draw was agreed in this position, and you can see that the, com the computer actually says that this is equal, but it's a very difficult position to understand and um, also play, I think, um, since there are so many weaknesses like pawns here, pawn on h4 potentially, very weak, the, but white black does have like an outside pass pawn, so um, chances are equal. But it's um, yeah requires more investigation. Um, so yeah, that is actually covers this queen f three option and this entire uh, time and off Sicilian after queen c seven. Uh, there are a lot of lines that I actually did not include. For example, in the queen f three line, uh, since uh, theory could branch out so much there. But that's essentially the gist of the time and off Sicilian. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video uh, and learned a thing or two. If you have any uh, insights into the time and off, or if you have any suggestions for future videos, please comment those down below, and I'll see you next time. Bye.